Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 9.11. And I don't know what sort of thumbnail I'm going to be using for this episode, but I have been using sort of Africa Core um, thumbnails, and they're set in the desert. And you may be thinking, well, have we been fighting in the desert? Well, you look at some of these provinces here out in the Ogden. Ogden region in down in Somalia okay well this is plains but these are sort of dry step plains actually not so much the verdant plains of Europe um, though I don't really know what that kind of plains is supposed to be but um, it's quite appropriate the you know North Africa um, Africa core symbology but even when we come down here um, they would probably be wearing the same basic uniforms of and yes, some of these same images are used twice, but then, hey, we got that, we've got that, we've got that, and Kilimanjaro, there was snow on top of it. Yes, that is a modern photo that I sepia-toned over that I don't think is photoshopped. I think they actually got it with the cloud layer and the elephant and whatever. And that's Lake Victoria, looking out from somewhere in this region. That's the train station. It is a modern photo. I sort of blurred out the modern car there, but that is supposedly the train station that was um, around at this time and maybe even earlier up in um, this part of the region. Yeah, I'm just sort of showing off Tanganyika. I'm sure we'll be doing that. That's Lake Ta um, Tanganyika out there. That's one of the ferries. I think that ferry still may be operating on Lake Tanganyika. And yes, that's from the German period, I believe. Um, and another photo of Lake Tanganyika. And then now we're back into the generic because I didn't do Zambia. But over here, so all of the, oh yeah, all of these I think all have, um, not necessarily unique, but they're not the generic jungle picture. They're, I just sort of found jungle swamp kind of things. And yeah, I'm showing stuff off here, I guess. That I, for the Comoros, the Seychelles. I think that may be sort of it for the, oh, Socotra. That was another one I did. Yeah, have these weird sort of tree things out in Socotra. Yeah, okay. And it's been doing really well. I know it's sort of fallen off and people saying hi, and that's cool. Um, not everyone's going to do that, but really appreciate it if you just take this moment and hit the like button. It's not that much work, uh, and it really helps the channel um, grow and I really need that. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm just, you know, and I've got some good friends now here, and you know, hey, yeah, your your videos are now doing in the hundreds every time, and that, yeah, that's great, but it really, something still needs to grow, or I'm going to have to shift. I mean, this isn't any sort of threat. This isn't sort of any immediate thing. It just, and it's not quit. Notice I said shift shift back to doing other things and just putting this whole stuff on a slower track you know I don't know this series or something like this on a five day a week instead of seven day a week I may, maybe you've already noticed I've cut down weekends to right now mostly just the 11 p.m. showing of this series or what will replace it you know the Hearts of Iron 3 series uh, and that kind of thing and so uh, you know really need to and, and the channel's growing and the channel's getting bigger but it's just not happening happening very fast. And I'm persevering. I'm continuing. This isn't any sort of gamer is feeling depressed and he's thinking of quitting. Nope. Nope. It's just I'm asking for your help to grow the channel. And also, if you can, another big ask is there's that share button below the video there. And if you hit that button, you get a bunch of op uh, op um, options. Uh, Twitter, um, uh, Facebook, Reddit, a um, uh, few other th different um, Facebook-like things, I think, that are in different you know regions of the world that are not English. Um, you know, Pinterest is on there, um, Tumblr. If you have do any of that sort of social media, have any sort of that kind of account, I'd love you to hit one of the, hit that button and see if there's something that you could share, because even if yeah, if you happen to follow me on Twitter, great. 
um, and if you happen to retweet um, the announcement video, great. But just by sharing it and doing it yourself really sort of helps the YouTube algorithm. YouTube, even if got, you know, hey, I've only got six people watching my, you know, um, following my Twitter account. Fine. And none of them may be interested in this, but just because it's out there helps the algor algorithm out uh, a lot. So thanks so much. And I know some of you have been doing it because I do sort of see some of the stats. I don't know who doesn't give me that kind of detail um, or whatever, but I do see that um, shares have been going up, and I really appreciate that as well. So really trying to just get the word out there. Okay, well, let's continue this and pick up the speed. So our main sort of operational focus right now is Africa, and we are expanding, of course, into India. We were trying to get across these this river here while being bombed and other things. And yes, we didn't have any transport, and I knew that with these divisions. That's why they're a bit slower. But they do have engineers. Yes, we control the Mediterranean. Yes, we control the Baltic. And we just got heavy cruiser main armament advance. Great. And that sort of shuts down for probably a long time. This because we have we are currently um, producing a bunch of cruisers, including some heavies that are going to take a while. But we're already you know what's that twenty percent of the way in, ten percent of the way in. Yeah, I could stop it, but I just didn't want to wait um, forever to get this stuff in production, and it has a long lead time. So, um, and these carriers are, are fairly out of date, but oh well, we're getting them. They're coming along, and when I build in the next round or two of them, they'll be improved. Things like um, this, these technologies, these upgrade fire control systems and damage control systems. These don't upgrade unless I send it back into the production queue and run it through so you know if you have some way outdated something or others and you're going hey yeah um they're sort of junk you can send them back to the production queue and run them through again and get a substantial improvement out of them potentially um obviously they're off the map board entirely during that period so you have to sort of judge on how much of you that you're going to do. Moving down a couple of mechanized units here we're going to pick up the um, okay um, you can support that attack and No, that, yeah, okay, that's the one I want. Um, we've already taken that other province. You support this attack. There was one I think I was getting. Yeah, this one we're going to stop supporting the attack. And you push into here. Now, if we look at infrastructure, I did sort of simulate. We can't see there, but, you know, we can't see anything really there that far yet. But I did sort of simulate the railway railway going up through here. Um, this one is down partially just because of the combat. That's why this is you know, more orangish than the rest. And there's also another railway that goes from here up to here that was part of the, the German colony and not connected to the railway system. I don't even think, I don't even know that it's connected today unless the Chinese have done it. Um, connected to the rest of the sort of, you know, Kenyan railway. Obviously this is an Tanganyika, but once the British got it, they never even connected it up to there. And this is, you know, you can blame the Europeans, of course, because they're the ones that did it. But then I don't blame the Europeans because the Africans haven't done it either back then. They didn't, you know, the Africans themselves didn't build any railways, you know, in the 19th century. Yeah, you know, oh, well, they were all colonized. Yeah, not all of them. Ethiopia wasn't. They didn't build any railroads. Um, and... Um, once they've become independent, they've mostly not built any railroads. Since then, they have other things to be corrupt on, and um, sure, you can have the energy. So, yeah, the rail 
so yes, the rail Europeans, you can blame them or credit them for building the railway system. And they were specifically built, like from some small port here up into somewhere in here, um, on the north side of sort of these mountains are sort of running right through here. And since this was the area of, they've sort of signaled out of impassibility here, but um, so they had a railway here for economic reasons and another one the Germans did just comes right up into to Lake Victoria right through there and that was it there they may have done but I don't think they did any spars coming out to Tanganyika but they may have done that I don't remember but that was the main one at least the ones I found on the maps of the time period and mostly um, no one's come in and, and replaced them yet or, or improved them or connected them you know internally because had they connected and you could you know you go, oh yeah European colonialism it's terrible and you know blah 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 yeah okay well the socialist nations Soviet Union etc now China is building mostly roads maybe some railways they're, they're doing a lot of infrastructure going in here making some very new highways but but they're making the locals pay for it they're not giving them the roads. They're loaning them the money for the roads and having Chinese firms build the roads. So basically they're going, hey, we'll pay our own firms to build these roads. Now they're also they're they're not, you know, they're not importing, I don't know, 10,000 Chinese workers. I'm sure they're they're bringing in a bunch of engineers and whatever and they're using a lot of local labor uh, and they're paying the local labor, but the Chinese are smart about this and that they're managing the system and they're not letting you know oh yeah we'll give you you know 10 million dollars to build so you can build a road and then only have a maybe a million of it spent on it and the other nine million stolen you think that isn't more common than um uncommon yeah you can look at nigeria and its history of these kinds of things including nigeria's oil profits and whatnot that just gets stolen and yeah so um and particularly like I know from Nigeria, it's not a bad thing that it's stolen uh, culturally because it's still left over from the, again, colonial period in which the government was some sort of foreign entity on top of um, your society, the colonial government, and corruption and stealing from it by the locals was thought to be a good thing. Not like a Robin Hood thing, but yeah, you stuck it to them Europeans. You got them to give you, a, you know bucket of cash and great for you you know so this sort of cultural um view of theft of government funds is um not quite viewed like we would view it in the anglo world at least i get that from what was my african studies course way long time ago who was um the one african studies course i took was um the, the professor was from nigeria so yeah um this isn't, and she, you know, and she was a Nigerian. I don't know what, and never asked her. I didn't want to be insensitive, and since she didn't, like, was she an Igbo, um, which I've read about, or because the capital's up here, and it's sort of run by these Muslims in the north right now, and sort of subjugating the people down here, and I don't know, and she never talked about herself, at least in, my, in the class that I was personally, and I just wasn't wanting to, like, which group are you from, um, I was already provocative enough in our courses. Um, but, yeah, so I get some of this stuff from those sources. And, yes, it very well could be out of date. Um, but I don't think too much. And so, yeah, this is, you know, the situation. And so, um, but even when the Soviet Union and the real sort of communist communist China as opposed to the modern-day capitalist communist China um, were doing their socialist revolutions here, they never seem to effectively improve the infrastructure and other things because I can understand them just letting a lot of stuff going to hell, but they did not even do some of the basic structural stuff like get railways connected. I would think that, well, what is it, uh, 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 Jomo Kenyatta's Tanzania would have loved a railway connection to um, Kenya. 
and that would give economic benefit to um, Tanzania was never the um, worst of the socialist or communist or however you want to say it um, countries I mean one of the worst is, is Zimbabwe um, Zambia was bad but not that terrible wasn't like the sort of radical um, Angola and Mozambique communist groups um, uh, Nakomo's um, Zambia was a eh, fair um, at least back in the the Rhodesian days they let the whites in Zambia sort of stay if they wanted to and could sort of eke out a living within their sort of society but um, you know I'm not just talking good or bad for the whites I'm talking about how um, stupidly socialist they were at the time but I would think it would be good for them um, economically to have the railways built and then I also think it would be good for the Soviet Union to have the railways built so that they could spread their socialism and their communism and their revolutions into places even more so like into Kenya which mostly stayed in the Western Alliance um, factor um, in Africa at the time so I'm just sort of surprised that you know, they, the Soviet Union or China or whatever, wasn't investing in some of that. I'm not surprised why the Africans really didn't do it or care because uh, culturally they just don't seem to. Um, they'll work on the railway, you know, building it or whatever, if somebody pays them to do it, but they just don't see the... They just don't see the effort... To improve things beyond their sort of immediate control or ownership I guess is how I would say that um, you know sort of a recent thing I think it was in West Africa um, watching some documentary or some reality TV show or something um, some Americans were driving through in their, you know, four-wheel vehicle and probably had two of them because they had a, a, you know, filming of one being driven around from another moving vehicle. So there was probably two of them there. Um, and the locals got really upset with them when they sort of cleared a um, bit of a roadblock across um, some road um, outside of a, a, a town or something without asking for permission because basically it was sort of a... a, a heist operation maybe a bit overstating it it was sort of a you know a tolling or taxing like oh well yeah we'll clear it for you if you pay it kind of thing and it wasn't like a a, a boom arm you know that you know you might think of a toll road with a an official looking you know um you know 50 cents to drive through here or a buck to drive through here no it was more like hey yeah we've sort of knocked over this tree and it sort of sits over the road and if somebody with a vehicle wants to come along and um you want to pay us five bucks or whatever, you know, and that's good money. We'll get 20 or 30 people out there and shift it real quick and, hey, clear the road for you so you can go on. And then, of course, after you leave and get over the, you know, the horizon, they'll push, they'll put it back and wait for the next vehicle to come along to then get sort of impassed and, um, well, we got to get through here. So, um, we want more African units. Um, you know, so when that happens, they, you know, it's that kind of thing and so they don't necessarily want a good road because they don't see it as a benefit no that's up there yeah how are we doing here we just recently joined the Italian push here what's this like oh these guys are gonna collapse and we're joining the fray down here good And this is cultural, I think, on various levels. One, the native African cultures, and they're different in different places. Mentioned the Ebos before, and from the various reports I get, they were very industrious and wanted to, um, this sort of tribal or ethnic grouping. It wasn't like just a one tribe. It was a um, sort of in Biafra, trying to break off of from, you know, Nigeria is, you know, purely a British creation. Um, it is, you know, it gets some of um, old um, German Cameroon, this sort of parts here, you know, that had been colonized by the Germans, and the French got the bulk of Cameroon, but part of that, it got 
um, this sort of region over here, um, which is, you know, so these are sort of the Ebos over here in Biafra. I forget what sort of the tribal groups, and it's, and there's a bunch of tribes, there's a bunch of different societies, but I'm talking sort of linguistic groups that they sort of, to some degree or another, recognize themselves as a, as a larger grouping of people, um, you know, and then there's this sort of group over here, and then there's this other sort of black African group up here that is mostly, um, notice sort of where I'm drawing it, I'm not quite drawing it way up here. Um, this, because these planes are getting more out into um, the you know Sahara kind of thing, but sort of in here, it's mostly a um, Islamic, and this is where we sort of see Boko Haram, and what's you now they're coming more out of um, uh, Niger and Cameroon and raiding and controlling in, into here as well and often going after some of the Christian communities up here, but the official capital of, forget what it is right now, of um, uh, Nigeria is up in this region, and compared to Lagos, which is a huge mega city. I mean, this, um, if you're going to call something urban, uh, well, okay, I don't know how big it was in the 1930s, but in the 1970s, it was a huge urbanite city, one of the largest in Africa. Um, yeah, Cairo's bigger, I think, and, um, you know, a few other bigger, but it's bigger, I think, than anything in South Africa, and I don't know whether, um, oh, Addis Ababa is bigger or something, but it's was uh, maybe the biggest outside of, like, Cairo or something, in or the biggest sub-Saharan African city, Lagos, but it got awful traffic problems and other things. So there's some of the reasons I understand why they didn't have the capital right there. Yeah, you can stop operating for a little while. You can go back into there, just let these guys go away. Hunt for subs somewhere else. And so, you know, different, and the different cultural groups within Africa have very different, distinctive groups, and some of them, oh, how do I put this? Um, don't know how much it's them, versus we outsiders want to sort of like the i don't know the maasai in 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 um, kenya they're sort of some of the taller african peoples and you know you see them in um i hope i get all this right it's going off the top of my head um in like the movie um starring uh, stuart granger whose real name is james stewart but there was already a james stewart or jimmy stewart actor at the time so he had to sort of sort of change his name a bit um, that King Solomon's lines, they were the sort of the, the big, or no, I'm thinking, no, the, the, the Watutsi or whatever. Yeah, maybe the Watutsi or something. And the really tall ones, it's sort of their pastoral. They herd cattle and, um, and, uh, sort of migrate around sort of their regions as, as they, they do that. And I don't know how much it's sort of, for the tourism industry, they sort of tried to keep them, um, probably getting some of those names wrong keep them um, in sort of traditional clothing and settings versus how much they they've cho chosen to do so but I don't see a lot of them or apparently a lot of them don't in photographs I don't see some sort of non-traditional tall guys wandering around you know photos of, you know of Mombasa or um, no, what's the um, Nairobi in Kenya um, so you know I don't know what but then we see a lot of other Africans that really sort of are very rapidly taking to urbanization and, and um, uh, you know sort of very urban and when they are um, in sort of small town Africa shall we say they're sort of wanting to be small town Africa and they're not trying to be some sort of pastoral, bush-native type um, uh, caricatures or something that people might sort of expect. And they're not doing that. Okay, you attack down here. Give them some...
And so, like I say, there's a lot of different, a lot of different cultures within Africa. And they, they do, you know, and, and when I say that generally things, they don't seem to be very industrial. That's a generality, of course, and I'm talking about large groups, and I'm not talking about either individuals or specific cultural groups. So, you, like I say, the Ebos, you can sort of find me a bit wrong on. Um, you have that, but I also think it's a sort of legacy of colonialism in that the people's cultural experience is being, yeah, in some cases forced to do it. Um, some, some might go to the, obviously there was slavery in Africa and there still is. Um, but, um, you might be shocked at that, but there still is uh, significant slavery within Africa. Uh, and a bunch of that um, was Muslim-oriented slavery coming up uh, these rivers and along these coast. Um, Zanzibar was a was the primary sort of Arabic slave trading um, mecca center here until the British came in and um, put an end to it. Why? You know, at a time before they were at all prepared to try to move into um, Tanganyika mainland, they came in and stopped the the Arabic slave trade here, and that was the primary East African slave trade kind of thing. Was a um, Muslim-based um, slave element, and then you have the sort of mm, yeah, some of it was slave. You know, what's the difference between forced and slave? Um, some people may say no difference, and you may be right on that, but it's more, I would say, a, um, I don't know, permanent condition versus temporary condition versus um, people with weapons coming to your village and saying, hey, yeah, you know, we're building this road out there. You come and work here and, you know, get the locals to work and build the road or the railroad or the whatever. And then once that stretches of it's done, well, then they're no longer forcing this group of villages to build it. They go to the next group of villages to force the labor, you know, sort of like conscripted labor. What's the difference between conscripted labor and slave labor? Well, you know, we conscript soldiers. And when, say, the Soviet Union was having some, you know, massive tank ditches and such built for the defense of Moscow, and they're basically conscripting the populace, was that slaves? Or was that just conscripted for national duty, you know, for the good of the um, state? May not be for the good of the people. That's, you know, may or may not be. Um, so if you come in and conscript the locals to build, um, to provide labor, because either trying to hire labor somewhere else in Europe, bringing Europeans in, uh, hiring labor, say, in India, bring in Indians in. The British did do that. Now, that was hired labor. Um, you know, again, that was just purely, we've got money. Anybody want a job and come, you know, come in for a job? They did bring in Indians purely on a, uh, you know, for-profit basis of the individual wanting the job. Or are you maybe hiring other Africans to come in and build it, but it's such a long distance and supplying the food and supplying the infrastructure and in some cases, different diseases in different areas that you would have lots of people, you know, fall over dead on. But the locals, they may, the ones that survive childhood are the ones that are hardy and are acclimatated to the, um, acclimated, I should be saying, acclimated to the local, um, you know, microbes in the water and whatever, you know. Um, and so they're the ones that are, you know, set up for that environment. So is, you know, forced labor to build a railroad. You may go, well, it doesn't help that village. Well, I would argue that having railroads come through, connect you to the world and allow um, modernization. At the moment, of course, it very well may be exploitive in that the railroad is built for a mine to, ex say, in this part of the region, often dig for copper. And the locals may not at that moment see a profit or a... Um, benefit to it. But over time, having railroads and infrastructure and modernization, I think, is a, is it now it's how you go about it. And, you know, and if, before someone and a few of us have been chatting on this, some of the stuff, if we go, oh, are you supporting, you know, they, you know, would shoot a bunch of people. And yeah, I'm not suggesting that, that to get that forced labor, it was 
justified to go in when people refuse to go in and shoot a bunch of people who um, refuse to do it. Or like the Belgians often, which we're doing some of that, but we're also often rounding up a bunch of locals and putting them in chains you know, to sort of captivate them to do this stuff and sort of torture them by, you know, wicked sort of attachments to these chains to hardly make them work, to try to convince others to do the work or you're going to end up that way. So I'm in no way saying that the way they handled it was um, acceptable. You know, I'm more just explaining what it is and that there is a difference between conscripting and slave. You know, not all conscripting is the same. Not all, you know, forced labor is slavery. Um, at least that we have apparently as a world and societies made that sort of judgment call. You know, like I say, conscripting soldiers. We seem to accept it. We can see we in not, not really the U.S., but in Britain, they conscripted women. You were to work. You were going to work. You could show up at an armaments factory and ask for a job and be given a job and okay that's good we won't conscript you you went and got a job and you're you're doing you know um war work or um you volunteered for um some service great you're doing that oh you've got four kids okay fine you're taking care of the kids uh you know there was various status but by, I don't know, 43 or something, 42, 43, if you weren't doing some of that other stuff, eh, the British government was sort of conscripting you. Um, maybe sending you to a factory to make, you know, munitions. Maybe um, sending you to the land girls to help out on the farms or to cut trees. They were doing a lot of timber felling to, you know, make wood for the mosquito fighters or landing craft or rifle stocks or whatever it is. There was a lot of forced conscripted labor of women, you know, to do labor type stuff in Britain. We seem to accept that as a society when it's needed. Now we can discuss whether it's needed now. And some people think that national service you know, six months or a year of doing, you know, some sort of national service is a good thing. And I have mixed feelings on that. I wouldn't say it's a bad thing, though I'm also sort of a freedom person. So kind of forcing it, I am uncomfortable about it because we're not sort of a unified society to some degree, degree like Israel in which we can sort of see that their national service is sort of needed and yeah it's not there's non-military options on some of these things and um often even though there's military options the bunch of within the military there's a lot of non-combat options um to do to to maintain that and so we seem to accept in the western liberalized world a certain amount of um conscription so yeah and that's sort of that. And so since Africa has sort of had that experience and have sort of an outside forces doing that stuff, I think there's become sort of a cultural reaction to that, that they um, are... Oh, I wanted to stop that. Cancel. Um that and that's what I sort of think about some of the industrial developments it's not that they you know if somebody's offering them good money and they wouldn't take the job that they're um, doing it but they don't seem to as a society really value it doing them doing it themselves let's look at this for a second Okay, uh, max strength yeah build cost is going up that's fine we've got a lot of ICs I sort of some Whenever you have a red thing there, I always, uh, I'm sort of, because I'm not a math person, person as you, those of you who watched this a long time, you know, you can look at, um, oh, some of these things here, uh, well, not build times, I'm looking for, oh, um, okay, see so here we have uh, minus 40 kilometers in range, which, um, heavy transport is what I'm sort of mostly worried about. Would that 40 kilometers help? But then, 
if you walk over here you go plus 80 kilometers for you know all of this which is based on the idea of you've improved the engines and maybe larger fuel tanks and so since I'm not doing the math on some of these things I'm sort of unsure of how well they're balanced out meaning if I do some of the others will they equalize out but then you know that sort of a thing and um, reductions in range reductions in um, speed, yes, but we've got more ammunition, so that means more air defense and air attack, which is great, but, you know, again, I'm not a math person, so, but we'll do this, it just increases the cost and improves the strength of the ships. So that is a, a good, uh, um, a purely a good thing for its operational use. It may be a bad thing for its production costs, but for its operational cost, we did not harm it. Okay, we've just dropped um, more forces there. You're going to come over here and grab this element of the Africa Corps. Rebase over here, because we'll get them off of here. They're swinging around. I don't know if they'll get there in time. Get Von Thoma out of Madagascar. Now we have these guys, and you join that fight. And you get out of that fight. We don't need to shatter you. You keep going because you're the main one that's moving in. And you support that attack. And I'm hoping these guys here... Oh, they've got reinforcements, but we're pounding on them. And they're under Monty. They're pushing up all right. Please be aware of some of the stuff I'm talking about. I'm talking about it very much in a way of just trying to explain it. And not trying to justify... something. Or even trying to put down peoples. Now you may go... Um, Um, well, you're saying they're not industrious, and yeah, yeah, but I'm not saying they don't necessarily um, do industry that they can do and that would benefit them personally. Because I remember watching some documentaries in which this is so, oh, I don't know the documentary, I don't know when I exactly watch it, but maybe the documentary is 10 years old. Some of the Africans that had, you know, just. Um, look like a hundred plus cell phones. Cell phones are becoming a big thing in Africa. But these are all like flip phones. And a lot of it's because, again, they don't want to build the infrastructure and they, are, they may be smart and they may be coming along later than all the, running all the wires to, to do landline communications. It's just easier to pop up cell towers around and less infrastructure development. So, but the, talking about people, you know, getting used cell phones and reconditioning them and trying to sell them and um, make them work and keep them working and, and that kind of thing, being industrious individually and people, like again, I sort of say what they can sort of handle and do themselves. Um, you know, handicrafts to sell to tourists, you know, African art kind of things that they're, you know, will we'll be industrious and make a lot of that stuff to sell to people who want it, whether it's the tourists or international buyers who are going to buy the stuff and then sell it on Amazon or whatever. That I see much more going on in um, Africa, but since they don't have, say, um, let's take again um, Tanzania, modern day Tanzania, they don't have a. Um, uh, a source for, you know, um, corrugated steel um, panels locally. Um, so you have to import them so that there's a limited amount of it in the country, um, you know, to put, make, you make roofs, roofs of, of your buildings and things like that. And so because the currency is not a hard currency so that they can't just go on to whatever the international sort of larger shipping version of Amazon and say, hey, yeah, yeah, um, we'll, um, we want to buy a bunch of these things, ship them to our country, and we'll pay you with whatever local currency. And they're going, no, pay in dollars or pay in pounds or pay in uh, RMB from China or 
whatever it is. And they don't have any. The local, you know, whatever sort of local um, intermediaries. They don't have that currency. And so they can't just get that in. And since I can't build um, Corridate, Corey, uh, uh, no, boy, I should learn how to speak before I try to do a speaking job. Um, corrugated, um, you know, steel panels or, you know, sometimes we often see it here in America as aluminum now to, you know, for siding or put on the roofs of sheds or whatever. But, um, you know, tin, you know, tins, steel or just steel or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. I can't make it personally. I don't have a machine that makes that. I can't do that, you know. Yeah, I'm a Western person, but I can't do it. Now, I can maybe go to work in a factory that does it, but I can't do it. So they can't do it either. So it isn't blaming the individual can't do it. So they're trying to recycle old materials and use the materials to build the houses. And sometimes in some of the places in Africa, wood is... Um, not easy to come by because there's lots of trees out there but there's lots of termites too now they don't go after the trees they go after dead wood and so they hunt up the dead wood and um, large pieces of wood get infested with termites very quickly and unless you've treated the wood this is why I think some of the, the, the building supplies that come in you can treat you can soak wood uh, and stuff, and again, I'm, I'm not a chemist, I don't know all this stuff, but you can soak some of this wood to make it um, not conducive for the termites or whatever to try to um, want to eat into it. But they don't have that facility to do some of that stuff. Now, it can still dry, rot, and still go away. And so the wood sort of, um, in a lot of these structures, um, collapses easily, and they're sort of tree felling and and um, getting of wood, then they do get it, but it's sort of like we've got a nice helicopter going over uh, you know, sort of like building with tree branches, if you will as, a, as opposed to building with two by fours and so we see them, you know they're, they're dealing with the environment with the tools that they can and again, I'm not trying to knock the individuals or the societies, it is just they're doing it the way they can and what they understand and the way their education, because a lot of it's education um, can handle the stuff and so they're working on it and they see their own sort of personal benefit uh, for you know building a house for themselves or fencing off their their garden from you know having waking up in the morning and having some wild animals eating the fruits and vegetables in their garden where they see you know the benefit to doing it for themselves but they don't seem to see the benefit of doing it for the greater society at least not, and, you know, then, you know, I know somebody post um, some pictures to some activists, local, they're trying to, yeah, that's a few people. That isn't the society as a whole for generations for a long time have been doing this, because obviously if they had, things would be a lot different. Okay, an order's placed, no need. Uh, Finland, um, uh, yeah, we'll take that, we want some money. Okay, no thanks, not right now. Not right now. We don't need any of the rationing. Um, deploy more fortress troops to Norway. Um, all right. And some uh, hypothetical additional hypothetical that never formed historically. That's a mountain uniform. Oh, who is that? I, little Hitler type mustache. Ah, I've seen the photo. I can't place the name to it. Okay. Yeah, we'll take it. We've got a lot of those. I'm shifting a bunch of the hypothetical and or real I guess they're here now yes they're here now okay so what are we not them that they would be fine okay get on board get on board liners are fast maybe not the fastest thing I've got here but they're fast enough and since we're looking at going to a we'll put you on board hopefully we'll find some divisions to add you guys to them those Brandenburgers and you're going somewhere else. I'll put you on something else, but um, be some of the core headquarters for some of these units and others over here. And no, I am not any sort of expert on Africa, and it's a you know it's a huge geographical place that has a reasonably decent sized population. 
You know, it isn't an, a, an empty place like like Australia, you know. And I don't know, we got a few viewers. Um, what is it? Uh, Tippett um, is there. But, you know, how many cities are there in Australia? What? Three, I think. You know, that most of the rest of the world would go, yeah, that's a city. Not some something that's incorporated as a city that's a sort of, you know, a largish town. Well, you know, is Canberra, the capital, really a city? Maybe. Maybe. Um, but I'm thinking more... Um, uh, Melbourne and um, Sydney. Where's Sydney around here? Um, yeah, Sydney and Melbourne and Perth. Those, to me, now maybe Perth isn't so big and it's just the biggest thing out here on the West Coast. And maybe Canberra is bigger. Maybe I should throw in Canberra, the capital. Um, but, you know, it's sort of all that. And a lot of this is empty territory. And, well, there's people there, some degree, but it's, you know, it's, it's a big empty place. And that's fine. It's not a criticism or whatever. It's just sort of an acknowledgement. But the population density of this part of Africa here is much greater. Now, up here, you get this part of, you know, the Sahara. It's much less. It's even emptier. Okay. Um, you guys come here. You guys come there. You're now, at least some of you are across, you're moving slow, but you're getting there. Um, yeah, let's help them, they can, they can take out. Okay, yeah, these guys made it, I don't know if you remember, I was worried about them because they lost supply and had to retreat when attacked. I was afraid they'd get overrun, but they didn't. I guess whoever was coming decided not to keep coming. So we're pushing back into there, and these guys are now out of supply here. Okay, um... Yes, you're coming there still. Well, um... You start supplying into there. Okay, and you start supplying over into here. I'm going to strategically move you. I know it'll take time, or take time to reorganize, but... You got no organization anyways of any level, and I just want to get you here to where I'm going to actually be dropping supplies. Okay, we were... Oh, good. 900 money. Great. We needed that. I want to get over that hump. Germans report Allied landing exercises. Okay, First Army. It looks like they're coming. Reclassify the Deutschland class panzer shift. Okay, the Deutschland class. It was a series of three panzer shifts. Armored shifts, a form of heavily armored cruiser. Built by the Reich Marine, officially in accordance with the restrictions imposed by the Versailles Treaty. Yes, yeah, so I did catch the Reich Marine as opposed to the Kriegsmarine. Um, the class, which comprises the, the ships Deutschland, Admiral Schur, and Graf Spee, were all stated to displace 10,000 long tons in accordance with the treaty, though they actually displaced 10,600 to 1,240 long tons. At standard displacement, despite violating the weight limitations, the design of the ships incorporated several radical innovations say, to save weight. Um, they were the first major warships using um, welding and all diesel propulsion due to their heavy armament of six 11-inch guns. The British began referring to these vessels as pocket battleships. The Deutschland-class ship was initially classified as a panzer shift or armored shift, but the Kriegsmarine reclassified them as heavy cruisers in February 1940. Okay, um... I'll continue building Deutschland class panzer uh, I guess we'll... I hope there's nothing good or bad about that. Now, mentioning some of this stuff, um, recent readings um, going on on the U.S., um, sort of, at, you know, at the in the 30s under... Um, the Washington and London Naval Treaties and whatever. The U.S. built some um, Bausch, or some heavy cruisers. I think that was the Brooklyn class. I could be wrong about that. And they were also dealing with weight limitations. Um, and what they did, instead of um, uh, going over the weight limitations, they decided to build... Um, to the weight limitation, but they, you know, um, well, we, you know, just they, they, they built in some extra space. One of the things they talked about was, is they, in the ship, they had some extra space for additional ammunition. 
basically what it was is is they would only you know theoretically for when for figuring out what the 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 weight of the ship was is only loaded in about one quarter of the ammunition oh well there's room for a war load out of or whatever they called it for ammunition but we're only going to be putting in you know because ammunition for the um i think they were six inch guns on the brooklyn class um but we're only putting in, you know, big heavy guns and powder charges. We're only going to be putting in, um, you know, a certain amount of, you know, loading up a certain amount of space you know, or, you know, of, of ammunition for it, and, which is a heavy thing. And I think, not sure on this, you know, only putting in half the load of fuel. Oh, well, we have spare fuel tanks if we, or water tanks, and you know, to load out more water. Or, oh, yeah, we could load in more stores, you know, food and whatnot on the ship for longer voyages. But the standard loadout for it is only, you know, enough food, I don't know, for, say, um, 30 days instead of 90 days and things like that to keep the weight, at least generally speaking, just this side of the treaty limitations. And so, and I'm not sure whether they were weight um, for the particular class of ship you know per individual or just overall weight of um, tonnage and that um, so they were doing they were the US was do, doing some of this creative math themselves so and just the difference is is say you're writing at this level on peacetime and then when you're at war because the, the tonnage is how much tonnage of water it displaces is how you know the, you know it's the weight of the ship and you can figure that out if you know if you know the exact dimensions of the hole you can figure it out by doing the math again i'm not good at that to, to see the volume of water displaced at any one moment which will give you the weight of the ship so you know at peacetime theoretically they would ride at this level and at wartime you know it might be two feet or whatever deeper you know the um we'll see if that has any positive or negative ss free will and panzer grenadier division nordland Okay, um, all right, yes, good. The Dutch NSKK recru uh, recruiting poster here um, of the Dutch NSKK. You need to belong with us. Join the NSKK Gruppe Luftwaffe. About 4,000 Dutch Dutchmen joined the NSKK. Again, this is from Tangen, uh, um, from uh, TRE. And so, um, just in conjunction, in sort of parallel to... Um, Revolver held events that are covering this. This one gives you a teeny bit of manpower, and there it is, a transport unit of um, modest ability. So, civilian transports. So, I don't know, use it for something. Yeah, obviously, the manpower just is in the pool, but um, use it for something. you got got um, another transport unit. Turkish military mission. Should we try to improve our relations um, with Turkey by showing off some of our latest weapon systems like the Tiger tank? This could show that the great German military will be victorious. And I just basically made this um, picture off of this photo here that I found. Uh, these Turkish officers looking over a Tiger tank. Um, which I thought was fascinating because at the time, you know, um, because even after all these years, officially, I don't know if anybody knows, and it's been upgraded, and sometimes they have depleted uranium um, armor um, added into it or not. For the M1 Abrams, armor is still sort of classified. So, you know, you're giving away a certain amount of information to the Turks, who are obviously going to write up a report on what they see, and whether that gets out to somebody else or not. So, uh, there's a problem here. Okay. Uh... I have a bad coding in here, so we're not going to do this. You see, when it says relation with null, change by 10, it recognizes that it's supposed to be changed, but it, there's a typo or something. It should be um, T-U-K, and I'll capitalize. I'm thinking maybe one of the letters or none of it's capitalized or something to have the relationship in, improved by 10. But that is not working right. No big, I mean, it's a you know bug, but it's not causing a problem and that nothing's going wrong. No, we don't want petrol ration formed the 117th Jaeger division was formed April 1st 1943 and redesignated this Greece and the Peloponnesians okay yeah we'll take that Reichstellerfuhr Hoch 
Frequent Forjung. Yeah, nice rolling easy off the tongue German. Um, there we go. I got Telefunken up off of the top. And that's why early on I have some events that for the literal Telefunk and the television and um, other elements development, you get some research bonuses because that's who continues to do a lot of this work once the war gets going. On a raid on um, Cologne on the 2nd through the 5th or 3rd of February, 43, the, a Sterling Pathfinder was shot down over the Netherlands. The HS, or H2S set it was carrying was damaged but not beyond repair. Fortunately for the Germans, it was only the second operational use of H2S. And known as the Rotterdam Garat, the Telefunken was able to reassemble it with the exception of the PPI display, like plot position indicator. That had been destroyed. That's you know the graphical thing that you you look at. It's technical um, advance finally convinced even Goering how far behind Germany had fallen in the technological race against the Allies. The loss of the Battle of the Atlantic and the drastically increased accuracy in, and impact of the bombings against the German cities and industries were immediate result of this lack of progress in German research. Goering called for the establishment of uh, the Reich Office of High Frequency Research to try to concentrate and speed up research in the strategic sector. About 100 or 1,500 experts in high frequency research were called back from their services in the Wehrmacht. Eventually, this led to the um, development of the Funk Garat, um, Fug, F U G. Um, 350 Naxos radar detector, which enabled the Luftwaffe night fighters to home in on the transmissions of the H2S. So we can form that, get some radar, um, various tech improvements. Yes, we'll do that or not necessary. Cost the supplies, we have plenty of supplies. We're on a low swing right now, down at 700, but we know that because we were just at 9999, it's going to come back at some point. I just hope we don't have problems um, in the meantime. Okay, Liechtenstein radar, night fighter improvements, blah, 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 yeah, um, oh, no, the light, okay, lift off a crew of the J night, um, defected in April 43, okay, now this is, see, this is an interesting story, it's not just over radar, um, by this point in the war, the British had become experts at jamming German radars, the lift off a flight crew of a Ju 88R1 night fighter defected in April 43, landing in Scotland, presenting a working example of the German radar for the first time. The subsequent refinement of window um, rendered uh, Liechtenstein um, radar almost useless for several critical weeks. Now, okay, window is a chaff. chaff. Um, most of you know what that is, but it was um, the British sort of code word um, for, I think, um, strips of foil. I don't know if they were aluminum, I'm guessing, but little strips of foil that was in essence, in essence thrown out of an airplane as it flew over a target area. And you wanted it very light, so it takes a while to fall to the ground, you know, minutes or more, you know, and you're pretty high up to sort of confuse the situation so that as you're flying over, German radar can't go, oh, they're flying at 5,300 feet, so set our airburst charges to explode at that range, so even if we don't actually hit the aircraft, um, it'll blow up nearby. And that, you know, so if you put um, window over the over the area, and you got guys just looking up in the air through, you know, night binoculars, binoculars made to bring in as much light as you can and yeah, how you know and sort of night range finder type thing how accurate are you going to be with the searchlights and how long you're you're you know getting on target you know yeah you can sort of tell they're somewhere around 5,000 feet but you know it could be 300 feet above that or 300 feet below that and that could easily put you out of the sort of window of um you know, the explosive charges for the flak guns and things like that. So that's what window particularly is and did, if I remember my documentaries correctly. So we can spend the supplies. Again, we sort of kind of have it or not, and we gain some aviation research. Now, of course, I didn't know of this, um, and I would love to understand the story behind why this group defected, and probably the Germans didn't know about it because the British wouldn't say anything about it. 
and the night fighter, um, if it was supposed to be operating anywhere over Britain, and they were using night fighters to go over Britain again at night, and they knew where the you know British air bases were on either taking off or landing or whatever for operations and try to um, spot and get aircraft when they're not ready to be attacked. So if it was something that was sort of supposed to be operating any anyways over Britain, um, the, Brit the, Brit uh, the Germans probably just wrote it off as being, you know, a loss of um, an aircraft. And that pushed us over on aviation radar, so we'll stop that. So we've now got better up to 45 on aviation radar, so let's jump into navigation radar. And how are we doing on that? Ah, just starting out. And I've been asked to try to keep these a little bit shorter, so we're going to end the episode here. I want to thank you all for watching. Thanking, thank you for liking the videos. I really do appreciate that. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Love to see you around more often. And, of course, I really love hearing from you. If you got a, you know got a correction for anything I'm saying, because, again, I'm just going off of memory and what I'm reading on the screen. Uh, love to have you post corrections, questions, suggestions, comments. Just, again, say hi and whatnot. Love, love hearing from you. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron.